Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. I don't even know that we'll need the microphone tonight, but it's set up, so we'll use it nonetheless. So we're glad that you're here, and we've enjoyed having the opportunity to tour around the district and have conversations like this with, with audiences large and small. So tonight, uh, we're going to share a slightly different version about the bond. And uh, there's actually going to be three parts to tonight's presentation. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Jeff Arnett. I'm the superintendent of schools. We have four of our trustees, I believe, that are in the room, one of whom I know has to leave for an event at the high school. Kim McMath is going to be departing here shortly, Jen Champagne, Heather Sheffield, and then John Havenstreit. So a number of the board are represented, and then also a number of our administrators are here as well. So at the end, there will be ample time if there are questions that you would like to ask or something that we uh, piqued your curiosity about and you'd like to have a conversation with us. That's why we're here. So the three parts of the presentation tonight, we're going to start with a very simple overview of school finance uh, because that actually kind of sets the stage for the bond and for understanding how the bond has been structured. And we've got a couple of individuals who have been members of our bond advisory committee. Dr. Virgil Flathouse is here. Holly Noel is here as well. Um, but um, school finance is integral to everything that we do, and we thought that our chief financial officer, Chris Scott, could tell you a little bit about school finance and just give you a primer on what this means and, and how the bond relates to that. Then I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy Trimble. He's our assistant superintendent for operations and planning, and Jeremy's going to talk about the bond and the specifics of the three propositions that are on the May 6th ballot and talk about what that means for each of the campuses. And then at the end, uh, we're going to be joined by Christy Rome, who is with the Texas School Coalition. She is on her way from the Capitol now. A hearing that she was in just ended, and Christy is our local resident expert on legislation. And there's a number of proposed bills progressing through the legislature right now that have to do with school finance. And we thought that you might be interested in just a really quick overview of the status of some of those. So we're glad that you're here, and we're going to make this very informal, and I think the size of the audience is certainly conducive to that, and we'll be relatively concise, and then uh, we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have, and then we'll let you get out of here, hopefully well in advance of this approaching storm that uh, we keep hearing about. Uh, one other person that I want to thank before we get underway here, um, Holly, thank you. Um, Holly Reed is the principal at Forest Trail Elementary and for hosting tonight's event. So we appreciate your support as well for being here too. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Scott, and uh, he's going to walk you through School Finance 101. Chris, there's the, there's the remote. There you go. Uh, good evening, everybody. Apparently, uh, 10 minutes is all you need to become a school finance expert. So let's get this going because it'll be a jam-packed 10 minutes. Okay, so when we talk about um, the budget, um, there's really not just a budget in a school. We deal with a bunch of separate budgets, which all have their different uh, funding sources and different ways that we can spend the money. But typically, when you hear us say the budget, we're talking about the big one there, uh, the general fund. But we're also going to talk some tonight about the debt service fund, uh, which we use to pay our bonded debt. And it's very important in, in the way that we uh, approach uh, our whole budgeting process. The general fund's important um, because it's the biggest and it's how we operate the school day to day. And so I've got a, a, a couple of things here in the, there's really a few highlights you need to keep in mind. Number one is we pay almost all of our staff out of the general fund and uh, more than 85% of the, of the general fund is used for that purpose, to, to pay staff. And so um, the, the other thing we, I want to point out is that the amount of money that we have in the general fund is limited. So I know that you pay, you're paying taxes, and we collect quite a few uh, dollars from you, but we don't get to keep all of them. And so the amount that we uh, actually get to keep is limited by the government or by the legislature. They set what's known as the basic allotment, which determines how much money we get to keep. And essentially, any collections we have beyond that become what's known as recapture, and we send it to the state. Um, and an important thing to remember is the, the per pupil allotment, or the basic allotment, has not kept pace with inflation, particularly in the last four years. The last time that it was increased by the state was in 2019. Um, and since that time, you may have noticed there's been some inflation. 
um, and, and it's been about 14.5% uh, inflation since then. Um, and so whenever uh, the cost of everything goes up, we, we're paying our staff more, the things we're buying cost more, uh, but we're not necessarily getting more money in the operations fund to pay for those things. Um, we put this up here just to kind of give you a demonstration. And so the blue bar represents the part that we're dedicating to um, salaries and compensation, and the little orange bar that's sitting on top is everything else. So there are other operation expenses that have to come out of there. Things like utility bills, things like fuel to put in your buses, um, supplies that we're buying uh, for your campuses. But one of our goals is always to uh, get those things as, as best we can and find another source to pay for those so that we can dedicate more money uh, to our staff. The debt service fund, as you might guess, is money that we collect, a special dedicated portion of the tax rate that goes to pay our bonded debt. Um, one important thing to remember here is that it is not subject to recapture. Uh, another important thing to remember is that we believe we've been very efficient in how we use uh, our bonded debt. And over the past 20 years, we've almost cut our, um, our debt service uh, tax rate in half from 23.1 to 12 cents. So when you get your tax bill, though, you don't see M&O portion and an INS portion, INS being debt service, you just see a single number. And this last bill that you got, it was 1.0046 or a dollar point zero zero four six. Um, but there is a, a, a differentiation in there. So there's a part that's called INS, and that's solely dedicated to serving the debt. And then the 88.46 cents is for the general fund, including the part that we pay back to the state and recapture. Here's a, a basic idea how it works. So the, the amount of money that you qualify for is known as the cost of tier one. And it's a function of the, the kids that you have enrolled in your school, the kids that are coming every day, and what kind of special services they might need. So if they're in special ed, for example, they might be qualified for a little bit more if they're in other special programs. And so they basically look at your, your total enrollment, um, how, many, how many of them there are coming every day because attendance matters, um, and what special programs are involved in, what services are they receiving, and they come up with a number. And so here's an example of two different districts a district like Eanes ISD that collects more than that amount and a district uh, which has a, an identical student population but collects less than that amount. So they've got a smaller tax base. So for in the example of the one who collects less money, the state comes in with state aid and fills them up to that level so they, they get the, the cost of tier one. For those of us who are collecting more, that's, re that's paid back to the state in recapture. And so if the cost of tier one goes down, for example, if your enrollment uh, decreases, which ours has lately, the amount of state aid, because that's not gonna impact your property tax collection, the amount of state aid that chapter 48 district would go down, and what it means is the amount of recapture that Eanes ISD would pay would go up. The uh, golden pennies and debt service taxes, on the other hand, work a little bit differently. So there are some pennies on the M&O side, the operations side, that are not recaptured. And we've maximized the total amount of those. We've gone out to, uh, to you as voters over the last uh, few years and asked you if we could uh, uh, increase the number of M&O um, taxes we assess. And at the same time, we lowered our INS rate so you didn't see a net change. But we, now we have the maximum, and these are valuable because as the tax base grows, you see that the amount of money that the district gets to keep grows as well. Same thing on the debt service side, and, that, and those are both important. And tonight you'll hear us say that, uh, that, that if this bond were to pass, uh, the tax rate wouldn't, wouldn't increase. We say it's going to stay exactly the same, actually. Um, the port, the part, uh, that's dedicated to debt service will not change. It's going to remain at 12 cents. However, because of uh, tax rate compression that the legislature introduced in 2019, you can see that the M&O rate has been going down 
uh, as a function of how much your tax base is growing. And so your total tax rate next year will actually go down even though your INS, uh, uh, excuse me, INS debt service tax rate will remain the same. And we like to point this out that uh, amongst local districts, we have one of the lowest tax rates in the area. Most of the districts that we generally compare ourselves to, uh, like Lake Travis or Hayes or Dripping Springs, have considerably higher, and that's because they have a higher debt service tax rate than we do. Uh, Austin's the only one who's lower, and they're not much lower. So, important takeaways. Again, how much money we get to have on the M&O side is driven by the legislature. Um, and the, the, amount, the money that we're taking in on the, on the operations side, that's primarily being spent on our staff. And that leads to one of our budgeting strategies, which is we try to maximize the amount of money that's coming in that's not going to be recaptured, and where we can take expenses that are in operations and move them to somewhere else, and usually that would mean to the debt service side. And that's why we utilize bonds, because we want to free up space uh, and allow us to do more for our teachers on the M&O side. Also, um, uh, as Jeremy will tell you, this, this bond that we're proposing right now is $131 million. We don't have an extra $131 million in our M&O uh, budget to do all of these projects, and so some of those projects would not be done. So on the increasing revenue side, you can see over the last 20 years how we've uh, identified and brought in some, some different sources of revenue, including our good friends at EEF, who have uh, brought in so much money to us over the years. Uh, the enterprise funds, those are those funds that we operate, which operate like a business, which can show a profit. And so these are things like uh, facilities rentals. And we bring in about $2 million a year from that. And, of course, the golden pennies. And I didn't run that back 20 years because golden pennies didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, and on the reducing of the expense side, uh, historically, we've gone out about every four or five years for these maintenance and efficiency type bonds. And the types of things we like to do are these um, roofs and HVAC and windows, really exciting stuff, buses. Um, but these are all things that would have to be done one way or the other. Uh, and if we can do them uh, by issuing debt and paying them with unrecaptured dollars, then we'd like to do that. Uh, in this bond, we proposed a couple of additional things. Um, software as a service, which is uh, newly classified as a fixed asset, uh, which we're all currently paying out of, out of uh, the m and budget, and would save us, uh, these two things together, about $2.9 million per year. And as I mentioned, uh, for EANS ISD, um, we have a very high recapture rate. It's about 64% of our M&O collections are actually recaptured and sent to the state. However, our bond dollars, we keep every dollar that we collect, and so we have the capacity to issue debt and while still keeping the, the INS tax rate low. And this is how much we've been paying. Um, you can see that we're, we're projected to pay uh, almost $122 million this year. This, that will be in, in August. Um, and since the inception, uh, since we started paying into recapture, EANS ISD has paid more than $1.6 billion uh, in recapture. Um, one thing that we get asked quite often is how are you able to um, pass or pay for a, such a large bond project without increasing the tax rate? Uh, and there are a couple of answers to that. Uh, one of them is that we work really hard to manage our debt load, to structure it in such a way that we, we have options. And also, when we have the opportunity, when we have callable bonds, um, we can sometimes uh, refund those bonds at a lower cost to the district uh, sometimes we have the money to actually defease those bonds 
uh, and just eliminate them from our, from our, um, from our bonded debt. Uh, here's an example of that. So you kind of see the idea. I, I mentioned that we go out every four or five years. And so uh, every few years, we will pay off one of our older um, issuances. And so you see a kind of a drop. And when that happens, uh, that means that we have a little bit more capacity that we can, that we can uh, issue a little bit more debt if we need to. And here's an example of some debt that uh, we're paying off. And so these particular bonds, it's about $15 million worth of bonds, uh, are the next ones which will defease, and uh, they're callable in um, August of 2024, and we intend to fully defease those at that time. And at this point, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jeremy and let him uh, talk a little bit about the bond. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, everyone. So now that you know everything about school finance in the last 15 minutes, what we want to do is focus on that INS side, the bond, the debt service, and why and how we structure bonds the way that we do and why it's structured the way that you'll see uh, on, on the ballot. So there's some uh, important aspects I want to cover real quick. But overall, the projects that you will see identified in the bond for consideration are kind of fall into four buckets. It's a maintenance and energy efficiency uh, bond structure, but safety and security, energy efficiency and savings, um, our student programs and support, and then lastly, uh, facilities. Like he mentioned, there's a lot of systems that need replacement. They become get to the end of the useful life and they need to be replaced. So that's kind of the four buckets that they fall into. And you'll see over the last four bond referendums within ENS ISD, a lot of the projects, you see consistency there. Why? Because in this district, we didn't build and replace everything at the same time. So all of our campuses are unique. They're all constructed at different times. The high school was constructed, um, probably 17 renovations at that, at that high school. So there's a lot of systems that come to their end of useful life on, the, on those um, individual components at different times. So you'll see. Same categories, but different um, components in, involved in those. Now looking at the, the bond development. So this began a long time ago. But one thing that we do have in this district that the board has committed to is having a bond oversight committee. The, it kind of rides through the entire cycle of the bond to, to provide that oversight and guidance to make sure that the projects are being completed, that we're committed to the uh, community. So taking that current group that's overseeing the 2019 bond, the board repurposed that group to the 2023 Bond Advisory Committee to develop the recommendation that, you're, that you'll see in, in front of you. So that group had to work over several months. There's more projects identified than are in the final uh, bond uh, rec recommendation, and they had to work through that and, and pare it down. So this time started in February of 2022 and worked all the way through February of 2023. So a lot of work went through that, through that committee, that committee of citizens had to make a final recommendation to the board. Ultimately, on February 21st, the board unanimously supported calling for a 2023 bond election. Something different uh, that you're going to see at, at the polls this time that we didn't see last time 2019. So just after the 2019 bond was approved, the 86th session of the Texas legislature wrapped up in May of 2019. And with that came some new laws that they enacted that really impacted how school districts structure their bonds and structure their ballot language. And this that you see in front of you is one of those new requirements that now through the Texas Education Code, you have to look at your projects and they are structured within a general proposition and then special propositions. So typically you'd see just a general proposition, one large um, grouping of projects that you just vote on one proposition. Now there's three. Now A, proposition A for maintenance, safety and efficiency projects, that's the largest proposition of $117.8 million. That's kind of your just general projects. But beyond that, any projects that go to improvements, renovations of any athletic facility that seats more than 1,000 spectators, that 
it has to be on its own separate proposition. That's what you see here of $2.4 million in stadium projects in Proposition B that are tied to Chaparral Stadium at Westlake High School. That's a new uh, requirement. And then also when it comes to technology and the devices, our staff devices, our lab devices, our uh, student devices, all of those replacements have to happen in their own rec uh, proposition. That's Proposition C, just over $11 million. So when you, as a community, a voter goes to the poll, they're gonna see three propositions um, that are voted on individually. But all of those propositions total up to that no tax rate increase of $131.4 million. So that's something new. Now what I wanna do is focus on the individual propositions. So again, your general proposition A, um, our safety and security upgrades, physical repairs, refer refers to every single campus. This is not a comprehensive list of all the projects. Um, every campus is touched in different ways, but one thing I want to point out are the first and last bullet contained on this slide. Because looking at our budget and how we can free up operational dollars which go to paying our teacher and our staff, introducing energy efficiency and solar. In the 2019 bond, we kind of started this, this theme of doing all LED light fixtures um, to lower our consumption in energy. Solar does the same exact thing. It lowers our energy burden and, and saves um, uh, utility costs that are paid out of the general uh, fund. But also, he mentioned instructional systems and resources on the technology side. Those are now considered capital assets. Paying those out of, out of bond frees up those um, items from the general fund. And those, all that can, together totals approximately $2.9 million in annual savings once all those projects are fully implemented. That's something that where we look at recapture and that obstacle that we have to overcome, this contributes to uh, more dollars in the general fund to go to uh, teachers and staff or anything else that the board wants to prioritize. These are, this is an example of some of, some of those uh, projects. The flooring, painting, um, security, prop alarms, additional f fencing where needed, HVAC systems. But there's a, a, a few line items we want to spend just a moment to, to focus on because there are no major construction projects in this bond, but there are some, some renovations to existing facilities the, that would help expand programs in this district specifically at the high school. So at the end of last fall, the district was able to acquire a new commercial property, a new, an existing building that you see in the bottom right. So we're gonna work backwards on, uh, on this. But 401 Campcraft, which is just adjacent to the high school campus on the north side of the, of the stadium, was uh, acquired late in the, in the fall. So evaluating how that building can impact the district in a positive way, it's an office building. It serves administrative purposes very well. So looking at that and how that could go to uh, expanding programs, our current administration building really, really could serve our TLC program, our learning center, which is an alternative program for our high school students right now, our juniors and seniors, providing a different environment where the traditional high school environment may not work well for them. This provides a different environment for them to succeed. So this would involve moving administration over to that newly acquired building, freeing up a current administration building to house that learning center, which is currently across the street near the tennis center. So with them going into, into that building, all of a sudden it frees up that current learning center for HOSA and our CERT and, and our CTE programs that are now housed in small classrooms down in the ninth grade center of, of the high school. So you can see as the waterfall um, works itself out that in the end, the high school will also um, get uh, additional classrooms that HOSA, CERT, and CTE will, will vacate. So you can see how impactful this, uh, these projects could be um, to some of our uh, programs in the district and especially at the high school. The Learning Center has always been a priority for the board and actually looking at expansion of, of that program. That couldn't happen in their current uh, facility, but it could happen if, uh, if the bond was approved and this transition was made. Okay, now moving to Proposition B, which is tied to, to the stadium. There are several components in the stadium that have reached their end of their useful life. Stadium, and, uh, bleacher, uh, safety components, handrails, the track surface um, within the stadium, but also uh, the, the video board. 
to show that, some, some of the pictures on the far right, you'll see the condition of, the, of that video board. Um, those components aren't made anymore to support that, that video board. And that not only serves football. This stadium is not just a football stadium. This is, this is a stadium that serves all types of students and our community as well. Um, we just last weekend had a great turnout for our best buddies walk that happens in this stadium. You, um, we have all of our sports, but we also have our fine arts and our performing arts programs that are here. Our technical entertainment crew um, that runs out of our performing arts center, they run productions of all of our events that happen within the stadium, and they're able to utilize that, that video board for part of their production and part of their learning program. Then the, the Proposition C for technology, just over $11 million. Again, like I, I mentioned earlier, these are those physical devices, those iPads, those laptops, those uh, media computers in the classroom. So since we're here at, at Forest Trail, we've been making these presentations at each individual campus and working our way through the district. This is our community-wide presentation, but since we're at Forest Trail, we wanted to share some of the specific uh, projects that are here at Forest Trail. Some of these will happen at every campus. Some of them are very specific um, to, to, for, to Forest Trail. Um, and working through this process, working through um, our, not only our principals and our campus leadership, but also our, our program administrators as well, identifying uh, these projects. So when it comes to um, the, the, the ballot language, you want me to take this one? Okay. So the second thing that is very important coming out of that 86th legislative session is a new change in the way in which our ballot language must read. Now the state law requires in that ballot language for each one of these propositions that it states that this is a property tax increase, regardless of whether that tax rate is being adjusted at all. However, this bond proposition would not increase the district's tax rate. It's very important because it is required no matter what. Every district must do this uh, regardless of uh, what they're doing to that interest rate. And that's that 12 cents that we're talking about that Chris mentioned. So now you'll see that every proposition has that as that last statement. Um, on the ballot, it will not be highlighted. But what we wanted to do is highlight it for you tonight so you understand what it will look like when you go to that, uh, um, to that poll. So it will state at the last, this is a property tax increase and every school district in the state of Texas must do this on every proposition. So some of the important dates, uh, April 24th, that's Monday, by the way. Early voting starts um, and the main uh, election day is Saturday, uh, May 6th for consideration. Uh, some, some of the resources. If you haven't seen the video, uh, it's, on, it's on the website. It's through social media a, as well. Uh, it, it's kind of a splainer video. It summarizes everything that we've, that I, I explained. It doesn't get into the school finance, but it explains kind of the, the structure and the components of the bond in about three minutes. Um, view that, share that if you, if you uh, want additional information. Also, as I mentioned, we're wait, making our way through a lot of different presentations, both at campuses for different organizations as well, and we'll continue to, to do that. As you can see, we have some dates uh, coming um, even t tomorrow. We have a couple. Website, everything, we hope everything that you need is on that website. If there's any information that you need that's not on that website, please let us know because we want to make sure that all the information um, to, to educate our community, to inform you, is, is there. Additionally, we have signs as well. These are just informational yard signs. If you're interested, you can take them. Um, those are free, uh, but they're just informational. And lastly, a resolution that the board has already passed. I mentioned it before that something very important to the community, to the board, is to have that oversight. And so this is a resolution to establish a bond oversight committee that if this bond was to be approved, that there would be a committee that would oversee um, the entire bond um, process from, from May on. And then for all that information, EansBond.com is, is the, the place that you go for, um, for any information around, the, around the, the bond. All right. 
Anything you want to share, Jeff? Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. So uh, Christy Rome is going to be here, I think, in a little bit. But until she arrives, this would be a great opportunity for us to just pause and ask questions. So I know that you may have some, and we want to give you the opportunity. Go right ahead. Yeah, I have, I have several. First off, I'm going to ask the question, you know, this whole no tax, no change in tax rate, I feel is misleading because it, great, the rate is not going up, but because property values have gone up so much. In fact, the, the line you keep saying you must put in there is in fact true, isn't it? Taxes will increase. But we don't know that. We don't have any control over well, assessed no, valuation. No, no. You, you, you know because you get it from the, from the appraisal district. Mm -hmm. You know what the, what, the, you know, what the property value base mm -hmm. is. Sure. So I'm going to ask a simple question. Mm -hmm. Is it true or false? Just It's a yes or no. Um, where is that? Again, I'm going to read the exact language. Uh, da, da, da. Will, the tax, will the tax rate, if the bond is not approved, Will the tax, will my taxes go down? If the bond is not approved, the rate does not change. No, I regardless. didn't say rate. Mm -hmm. You keep coming back to rate. Mm -hmm. Will, please, rate and an absolute figure are not the same. If my, pro the rate, the rate is multiplied against the valuation of my home. Mm -hmm. If the value, if the rate stays the same, okay, and the valuation of my home goes up, I pay more. If you don't approve the bond, will the rate go down? No. If the, it will not, the rate will not go down. No. The rate will, so, so this is a magic free money? How, explain how, I don't, I don't understand, I'm stupid. Please help me. If the rate, if, if we don't take on another $131 million worth of debt, which you have to service, mm -hmm. how does the rate, and, and all of a sudden, we're now going from whatever it showed before. We're going to effectively double our amount of, of debt from 131 million to 260. If that rate, if we don't add to that, the rate should go down to service that. As, assuming that we we're not stupid and we don't uh, uh, refinance our bond debt at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. So it's, please, I, you you're obligated to put in that that line. Is it correct or not? Will my will my will my taxes go up? I don't know. No, you. So you, you, that, that's I. Where's the, the CFO? Though? So, Chris, can well, you talk a little bit about assessed there? valuation? Can you, can you yeah. say that? Based on news that we received today. Okay. Yeah. So we we did receive some some news about uh, the assessed valuation of the district, and, and it has grown. And I'm sure your your house your assessed value of your home has grown. The question is. Um, it, let me let me rephrase it and make sure I get it right. Um, is that your taxes uh, are going up because we'll be taking on additional debt? There, thank you. So that so in effect, my taxes will go up. That is the, what the statement requested you include in the thing is in fact a true statement. It, semantics. Okay. Um, <laughs> will I be paying more? You will. Yeah. You will be paying the same. Um, okay, so, can I, so I can write the same check this year as last year? Is that what you just told me? Would that be okay? That's so where, where, is the, where is the appraisal district going to come after me if I pay the same amount? You, 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 I'm, I'm sure you're going to have to pay the amount that comes on your, your, on your tax more, bill, which, which will be more. Thank you. That's, that's all I want. Why are you guys, why are you, I mean, I see it. It doesn't say it on here, but it drives me crazy that you put in big red here, um, will not increase the district tax tax rate. That's mm -hmm. great, because the tax rate can stay the same if the base mm -hmm. goes up. We multiply two numbers together. If we can keep the rate the same if the base goes up. But guess what? If the, if we don't take on the debt and that and the base goes up, the rate should go down to service the existing debt. Is that correct? Would you have to would you have to adjust the whatever that number was, 1.24, whatever the number was. I wasn't paying attention and didn't write that down. Would that number have to the, the 12 cent tax rate. Yeah, 12 cent tax rate. Would it go down? It might. No. It, no let me answer the question. Yeah. It might go down. Um, and and, the, and the, it would depend on what uh, the, the, the board and the community decide to do. So if the bond were to fail, yeah. um, it might be that the board says, okay, we're never going to attempt to pass another bond again. Clearly, the community doesn't want bonds. And in which case, you're right. 
eventually the, the debt service tax rate will go to zero because we will pay off all the debt. But the year on year it would go down. You would... It, it, it doesn't have to. And so um, what, what would be required of us is that whatever money we collect uh, for debt service must be used for debt service. And so there, there's a certain amount that must be paid in a given year, and then there's a certain amount that can be paid. And so um, in that hypothetical situation where we're never going to have another bond issue, um, it, it might be the decision of the board, let's leave it level at 12 cents, and we're going to pay off that debt sooner, we'll get out of debt sooner, then we'll drop it to zero. They might do it a different way. Um, however, they might also make the decision that they want to go out again for another bond because these are projects that the district uses and the district um, provides services that the, that the community wants and, and feels like they need. And so if that's the case, then it would probably stay exactly where it is. And so um, I, 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 want, I want to grant to you, you are correct, yes. You're going to pay more taxes this year than you paid last year. Um, it's also correct that we don't intend to increase the debt service tax rate. Yeah, but the, the rate, that doesn't matter. It's the, 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 it's the amount that comes out of the pocket. The rate's all fine and dandy. I don't pay a rate. Mm -hmm. I don't pay whatever that number is. I mm -hmm. pay that times my, my house. Yes, and, 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 and let, me, let me just say that if it did go to zero, that would still be the case because there's still the M and O portion, which is the largest portion of your tax rate, and and and, and as your evaluations go up, so will the amount of taxes you pay, and this is true anywhere that you live uh, in the state of Texas because no matter where you live in the state of Texas, um, you live in a school district, and that school district uh, issues a, a tax, and if the value of your home goes up, then then the amount of tax you're going to pay is going to go up at least until you get to be 65. Well, and also it's a function of commercial and residential and a lot of time. But, but let me just mm -hmm. ask a quick follow-on since you brought that up relative. We're going to go from 130-some million, if mm -hmm. I remember the bar chart, we're going to double that. That's the intent here, another 131 million, give or take. Roughly, yeah. 117 million of that, okay, is for what you call maintenance. Mm -hmm. Now, presumably, and you probably know the numbers better than me, after you include the debt servicing cost of that, that 131 million looks like 260 million, really. What's the, it, just, yeah, no, not not that much. Obviously, explain we, why, we explain why. I understand. You know, we, we have we can get better borrowing costs than, than you can get, obviously. Um, but yes, of course, there's interest. So so let's say it's 260. I don't know if that's the number, but maybe it's more. I know most mortgages are about five percent. You end up paying you know two dollars in interest mm -hmm. for every dollar you pay off the principal. Talk about a $2.9 million annual efficiency savings. If mm -hmm. that's $260 million and I'm getting $2.9 million of an efficiency savings, mm -hmm. I just shouldn't do this. I should just let everything fall. I, you know, I, this is ridiculous, but my point is that $2.9 million, million efficiency savings, it would require 100 years, 100 years of that, 89 years, mm -hmm. whatever the number is, to recover to recover that, and the bond just doesn't provide a return on the investment. Okay, it depends on how you look at it, um, and you probably won't like this, but I'm going to I'm going to jump into it anyway. And and that has to do with the limitations on how much money we actually get to keep on the M&O side. Right. And so we're, we're extremely limited in the amount of money we have. Um, and so the board works really hard to try to give our our staff, our teachers, raises every year. Um, and we don't necessarily have more money on the operations side to do that. And bonds is one of the ways that we make that room. If we were having to replace um, HVAC systems and roofs and buses and all of those things out of the, the M&O budget, um, we wouldn't have the class sizes we have. They would be 50 to 1 easily. It, it, would, it would increase our M&O budget to such an extent that... that um, the school system that, that the community has grown to know would not operate the way it does now. It just could not do it. The, the reason we're able to provide the services, the reason we're able to provide the programs that we do is because we utilize the bonds. Okay, and I, and I, and I buy and I, I fully get that particular part. So in other words, we're going to lose money on the, in effect, the bonds are incredibly inefficient because they offset 
not having to take money out of the M&O. Well, I don't think they're inefficient at all. Um, it, if, if you look at the amount of money that we, that we lose out of, out of the M&O budget, 64% of the money that we're collecting on the M&O side, we don't get to use it all. We, we're, we're operating the district on about $80 million, which is somewhat on taxes. Some of it's coming from EEF. It's coming from different sources. But $120 million were sent into the state. We don't have all the money that, that we're collecting, and we can't have that money. We can't just say we're going to send less um, and, and recapture this year because we think we need it. Um, it's, it's prescribed how much we get to keep. Uh, we keep that amount, and, and we work really hard to provide, again, the programs that, that we've become known for. Thanks for your questions. So obviously you're well informed. We're glad that you're here. We appreciate the questions. And that's okay. That's why we host the town hall. We want to give people the opportunity to ask the questions that they have. So thank you. Yes. Hi there. So my name is Andrea Marlowe. My son is in first grade at Bridgepoint. Mm -hmm. I attended the meeting last week at Bridgepoint. It was very informative, and I thank all you guys for doing this. Um, after the meeting and after talking to some other, other parents, and after reviewing uh, the Proposition A specifically, I noticed that there was only 1.4 million um, budgeted for safety and security. Mm -hmm. And most of that safety and security was for door, safe, door locks and uh, cameras. Mm -hmm. And while I think that that's great, um, I think that cameras are going to be great at recording a disaster, but not protecting against it. And so I, and, and also I noticed that there was, I think, 7.4 million or 7.1 million devoted to outdoor surfacing uh, replacements. So I don't understand why we're spending more money on outdoor playground like replacements over safety and security. Mm -hmm. In that same line, um, I spoke to somebody um, who informed me of an or a company that's based out of Minneapolis called 3D Response Systems. And they, um, they <coughs> are able to basically install um, buttons in each classroom where you push the button and within 30 seconds the cops are called. Each room is turned into basically a ballistic proof safe safe room. Mm -hmm. um, and the children, it's, you know, the children don't even notice that these ballistic um, panels are even there until the teacher pushes a button and they're deployed. So they cover the children, they protect the children, and the police come very quickly. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, in the vestibule of each school at the front entry, let's say a shooter tried to get into the front entryway, they're able to make their way through the first set of doors. An orange powder is deployed that covers the person in orange powder and then positively identifies the suspect to police. Mm -hmm. There are multiple different layers to this company. Why are we spending more money on our playgrounds than protecting our children from being murdered? Sure. Jeremy, you might want to come up on this because I know you worked with the Bond Advisory Committee as well. What I'll say as he comes is our, our playgrounds are used every day, um, and obviously they – I understand your point. Um, and the technologies related to school safety and security are evolving every day as well. Uh, we've seen a number of these products. We probably receive uh, probably 20 of uh, those sales uh, enticements from vendors every day about safety and security so projects. Well, because they're not all proven effective either. Okay. Um, Given the opportunity <clears throat> offline, could I present this information to you guys? Like, is there any sort of way? Because I know literally every single day I drop my son off at school, I don't know if I'm going to pick him up. Mm -hmm. And that's terrifying. <clears throat> and sure. quite frankly, what is being proposed in these bonds does not make me feel any safer mm -hmm. whatsoever. Sure. Jeremy, do you want to talk a little bit about the safety and security element of the bond? Absolutely. Um, and so when it comes, say, to playground safety um, and those components that are tied to this, there's some safety and there's also surface replacements. Um, those come up. Those are just like the HVAC, right, that comes up. Um, it's still tied also, to a different component of safety. Also, at Bridgepoint, there are absolutely no gates protecting the playground. Mm -hmm. You can freely walk onto the playground night and day. There are some fencing, but there are no gates. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, fence, fencing's interesting, right, um, because this is, this is a challenge that we've had even even with our, with our campuses as well, because we are the parks and rec for our community, and then providing access, but locking gates and things. So it's, we have to balance that. Um, but when it comes to safety and security, I'll tell you that 2015, 2019, 2023, there's always been components in safety and security. 
Um, I don't want to say that safety is not valued because of the, the, the number of dollars contributed to this bond. Last bond, we had a lot in fencing. We're still even working on some of those. Access control allows us to take what we have and expand it. Once we find technologies like that, that's one way to understand it is we do get these meetings and we actually meet with them. And I would love to actually talk with this, this group. It'd be, I love understanding what everyone has. It might not be the great best solution for us, um, but we consider everything. And um, a lot of times that what we're seeing right now are actually these applications that are serve corporations very well, and then they're just not familiar with the K-12 space. And so we have to work with them that we don't have corporate dollars here. And so what can we do possibly? What plans are available that we could do that we could afford within the K-12 budget um, scenario? But I would love to meet with them. Um, we're, we're always looking at what resources are out there because tomorrow there's going to be a new one. And we want to make sure that we vet that and look at all um, aspects of that. And if any community member hears of something, last time at the bridge point, I had, I had another um, parent come up um, about, about some, some software as well. I want to hear about those because if they haven't knocked on our door, they may be coming up. But if we can know about it ahead of time, then, then that's great. And if that comes up, if there's something new that may not be in this bond, please understand that when we go through a bond, this going to go through 27 and 28. We don't know everything that's going to be, uh, that's going to come up in the next uh, four to five years. We try, but we have a bond oversight committee that we can always work with if something was to come up and we can work with them and our board of trustees. Um, if priorities may change, um, then we'll have, have those um, um, d discussions. So how did you guys decide what stakeholders you wanted to put in? Like, did you guys work with police officers? Did you work with people who are familiar with that computer? Yeah, a lot of it comes from what we, we do now we are actually required to do audits every week. Um, and we have to do our main audit through the Texas School Safety Center every three years. And so we take a lot of um, the feedback that we receive from those pro professionals um, and apply it to our campuses specifically. Um, Bridgepoint may need different things than say Forest Trail needs. And then we work with our principals and any program administrators if it's a, a secondary campus. And, and what we wanna do is make sure that Things that we're putting in place do not impede what they're trying to do throughout the day and if we can work with them. So we, we sit down uh, with, with all of them and uh, that's kind of how we went through the process this time as well. Evaluated, we had some great conversations with the Bond Advisory Committee working through safety because their parents just like everyone here um, and so they, they wanted to make sure that we're covering um, as, much, as much as we can, understanding that We've worked through three bonds now to try to improve safety. But just like you said, you said a very important thing, that it's multiple layers. That's the most critical piece is that we take all of these layers into consideration. We just um, met with a, uh, a company um, today. Again, they're seeing everything from across the state. And while they represent that we're ahead of a lot of districts, I still understand your concerns, though. And I want to take us even, even further um, if, if, we, if we need to, if something comes up and a solution is there that would benefit this district. Then we need to at least listen and, and, consi and consider that. Um, so I'd love to, to talk to you even after this or whenever we can get together. Absolutely. Yes. Security as in? So we have school resource, two school resource officers at the high school, yes. Um, we do not have any sitting at the campus. Um, those school resource officers at the high school, if needed, they could, uh, they could respond to, okay. to the middle school. So I was just wondering, like, you know, we have a discussion, and that's what girls tell me with the schools. And mm -hmm. we ask first time, do you know when these girls are sick? Okay. okay. We have no idea. Again, okay. we're not trying to scare the kids. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I can promise you, probably a lot of them don't know what time the clock sound sounds like, you know. So we ask them, what happens if you're in the bathroom and the alarm goes off or you can tell us who's bathing? Pretty much out of hand because I know. I'm not going to blame the teacher who told not to open their door, you know, because there's a massive shooter. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to blame the schoolers because they don't. I understand all of, there's so many different options and stuff. But if you have someone on the ground interacting with these kids and they're, you know, that could take seconds to get to minutes of the police response to get to the school. And I don't understand, you know, I keep hearing from the board members that they care about the kids, they care about the kids. But when a shooter goes on campus, you call the police. Yep. 
they're there. They're going to be the first responders. So why don't we have security on the elementary school campus? So what I can assure you of is the board is having those conversations with the administration. We've actually. Okay. Well. I don't know who. I don't know who put a three-year time stamp on that. Uh, that's certainly not anything that we have discussed. Well, the board is going to have a conversation publicly about what some different options and scenarios may be, and that will happen as early as May the 9th. So, I, I, well, it's a priority, and I think what what you're interested in is the addition of personnel. And please understand what we're talking about tonight is the bond. We can only use a bond for capital improvements. Well, we certainly understand that concern, and I think you'll see on May the 9th, uh, the board intends to have a public conversation about some potential options and a timeline, perhaps. So, And that has to work out, work itself out over the next couple of months as the board and the administration work through the budget cycle before they adopt a budget for next year on June the 20th. So, okay. Any other questions about the bond? <laughs> I think you guys can come back. If okay. nobody else has Well, I appreciate that. I'll tell you what, let's do this. Um, Christy Rome has joined us uh, straight from the Capitol. Uh, Christy was in a hearing there, and she's got a brief overview of some legislation that's progressing related to school finance. We felt that was connected to the topic this evening. We wanted to give Christy an opportunity to provide that, and then we'll hang around afterwards and be happy to answer any further questions that you might have. So, Christy, welcome. We're glad you're here. Let me hand you that. All right. Sorry to be a late addition, but uh, I made it just in time. So, okay, thank you. Uh, and just wanted to want to give full disclosure that everything I talk about is in flux. None of these bills have passed. Um, there are very few bills. I don't think nothing's been sent to the governor's desk yet. So all of these things could fail, and nothing would happen, and they could change along the way. But this is kind of trying to use my crystal ball and kind of give you a prediction of, of what they're talking about right now and what I think might change. And the first thing uh, that I can prom almost guarantee you is that we will see property tax relief. Uh, there are dueling proposals in the House and Senate right now, so I don't know which of these we're going to end up with. Uh, but the most, the, what they have in common is that they spend about the same amount of money. How they spend the money is, is different. Uh, the, on the House side, they are giving additional tax rate compression of 15 cents, which is, means next year the tax rate would be 15 cents less, and then also appraisal caps. Uh, which would continue to give uh, property tax relief over time. The Senate side is talking about an increased homestead exemption that would apply to um, increase that homestead exemption to $70,000 and also would increase the homestead exemption for 65 plus, uh, those on the frozen levy, which did not receive that tax relief in the past. Uh, they've also talked about additional compression, business tax relief. All those things have very similar numbers, but obviously you can see they have a lot of work to do to work out their differences. Uh, I do think, though, they will not end the session without giving us property tax relief as a state in some form at a, at a, a historic levels. Uh, that's what they keep saying is that this is historic property tax relief, the most property tax relief we've ever seen given in the state. Um, on appropriations or what they're spending in the state budget, again, we see the commonality of they agree on how much, but perhaps not how to spend it. So they both have increased funding for enrollment growth. They both have... Um, increased funding for basically current law requirements that exist, and then they have $5 billion in new money. And $5 billion may sound like a lot of money, it is a lot of money, but in a state as, as large as Texas, uh, to keep pace with inflation, since the last time school funding was increased in 2019, that would require $13 billion. So $5 billion gives you some idea of kind of where that falls and what difference that would make. Uh, there are differences, too, in how they want to spend that $5 billion. Uh, I know that's not shocking, right? So on the House side, they talk about things like teacher compensation. Uh, the basic allotment is just, in general, in funding increases for schools, uh, instructional materials and technology. I was in several meetings on that topic today. Uh, special education, increased special education funding. And then on the Senate side, 
They've talked about using that $5 billion for private school vouchers, teacher compensation, school safety, instructional materials, and technology. This technology didn't fit on my slide. Uh, and then special education. So you can see there's also, again, some things that are in common uh, between the two and some differences that they'll have to work out as these bills move through the process. Uh, I will note that conferees were appointed today for House Bill 1, which means the five people from the House and the five people from the Senate who get to work out those differences. And good luck to those 10 folks. Uh, then when we look at teacher compensation increases, again, we see a very different approach. Uh, the Senate has talked about giving an across-the-board one-time increase for teachers, nurses, counselors, and librarians. Uh, in a district the size of Eanes, that would be $6,000 per each of those employees. It's for one year, though. It's for the 23-24 school year that those employees would receive that increase. The House's proposal is that they would increase the school funding formulas and then 50%, at least 50% of whatever the district receives in increased funding would be put towards increased uh, compensation for teachers, nurses, counselors, and librarians. And then the other 50%, the district could decide how to use that. Uh, and then education savings accounts is a big topic over in the Capitol. Uh, the Senate has passed Senate Bill 8, which would provide education savings accounts and other um, par parental rights provisions in that bill. And um, what that would do is it would give $8,000 for a student to leave the public school system and to enroll in private or home school. Uh, and then if that student were to leave the public school system, it would provide uh, $10,000 for up to five years for the district that's the, the size of Eanes for the, the student who's left. And then on the House side, uh, it's only been heard in House committee, but the, if there is a bill to move in the House, I think it will be this one, and it is education savings accounts for students in special education or with special needs. So, um, and you can see the dollar amounts there. It's, it's a little bit more than the 8,000 because obviously we know that our students with special needs um, cost more to educate and meet their needs. So that's kind of an overview of major issues right now in the legislature, and I'm happy to answer any questions or I'm also happy to just stick around if not everybody wants to geek out on legislative matters too. <laughs> That's y'all's preference. Can you talk about SB 11 and how much increase the safety allotment would be? So the, the, um, the Senate's, that's the school safety bill. Um, and so a little history on that was that in 2019 when that bill was first passed, they talked about the school safety allotment and that it would be $50 per student. They actually ended up funding that at $9.72 per student. So now uh, they've come back and revised that in the Senate, and instead of having a per student allotment, it's a per campus allotment. And so I believe that with the size of campuses in Eanes, some of the campuses would receive about 15,000, others would receive about $16,800, uh, depending on the size of the campus. You would get a per campus allotment to pay for safety. Uh, there are also provisions, there are bills similar to Senate Bill 11 uh, in the House that will be heard on Monday. So on Monday, they're going to the House, we'll hear both House Bill 3 and House Bill 13, and those would increase uh, the student safety, or the, yeah, the school safety allotment. Uh, that has a, one of them has $10, and one of them has $100. One of them requires uh, that the district have uh, armed officers at every campus, and that's the one that gives $10 per student. So uh, the testimony in that bill was that it, that does not cover the cost of an armed officer at every campus with $10 per student that doesn't cover the, the salary and benefits of an officer. So um, does that answer? Those are the major school safety bills. There's a, a lot of other kind of um, bills on school safety that don't really affect funding that are more different requirements and provisions and plans. And um, there's a couple bills that are moving about panic alert systems and things of that nature. And again, I'm happy to stick around. Thank you. Uh, real quick, uh, are there any bills uh, that would uh, have a meaningful impact on the basic allotment? <laughs> um, so House Bill 100 includes an increase that over two years would be a $140 increase to the basic allotment. The basic allotment is the, the building block of our school finance formulas. It's set right now at $6,160. Uh, and then you add student weights on top of that. Uh, so the basic allotment increase that's proposed in the House at this point in time would be a $140 increase. Again, if we were to keep pace with what the effect of inflation, that would require a $900 increase to the basic allotment. And what's being proposed right now is $140. So it's really nothing. 
Well, it's, it's better than zero, but uh, I don't think that it quite helps keep pace with inflation. There are no bills uh, moving through the House or the Senate uh, that will have a meaningful impact on the price of commodities. At this time, if 140 is not meaningful, no. Um, I, I don't know what all the details will be when they work out the budget, but at this time, no. It, it's not looking very optimistic for uh, funding that would you know, and again, with inflation, I know I keep referencing that, but that's just to, to have the same buying power of dollars that we had four years ago. Um, and we don't see that at this point in time. And what would the number be? I think you called it at one point. The number that if they did the $900 baseball. That's a $13 billion cost for the biennium. So that's for two years. But And we've done, um, I think in the appropriations bill, it's how many billion? Uh, $5.9 billion for the public education fund? It's $5 billion for new funding. Christy, thank you. Uh, Go ahead. You seem to know your, your, your numbers really well, so I'm going to ask about inflation versus property value uh, increases. I have a feeling that property values have far exceeded even the crazy inflation rate we've had right now. And even when you take into account you know, that that increases the recapture of that, doesn't that actually mean that in terms of real budget, real budget has gone up? So if you're including the budget of what your district is paying in recapture, then I would say yes, yeah. because you have to make a much larger I, I recapture payment. That. But in terms of when property values increase and, and, and residents are paying more in property taxes, that does not increase the operations funding that the district has to use because the school finance formulas make it so that that is capped and, and held constant. Well, it's capped at a rate. It's a number, right? Isn't it a it's No, a so, that, so that 6,000... 160 yeah. number that's the basic allotment hasn't changed regardless of how property okay. values have so changed really the, the, yeah but, but my only I guess my point is that at least for this district and probably many others the this whole inflation argument is kind of a mox mix because property values have exceeded you know have exceeded um, the inflation rate ergo that number that allotment number has gone up no the number is set in statute. It has not changed. So the difference that happens when more property taxes are paid yeah. is that Eanes ISD pays more in recapture to the state. Yeah. So the district's writing a larger check to the state. It's always been in the 60, as you said, 64%. Forever, for 20 years, it's been over 60%. I mean, I so this, I the state's... Been 60, over 60%. Historically, so, it's been that. So it hasn't gotten greater. <laughs> But I think that the issue is that, yes, property values have increased tremendously, especially in certain areas inflation. like this. In this area, yes, property value growth has exceeded inflation, to be clear, sure. Thank you. Yeah. But the difference with that is that that property value growth does not benefit the district, except for on the INS rate. Right. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, it is... A little after 7 o'clock, and we're all well aware there's a weather forecast that people, I think, are paying attention to tonight. We wanted to give you the opportunity, if you feel that you need to go ahead and leave to get ahead of that, you're welcome to. But we're going to stay, and if you have other questions that you'd like to ask, we'll be available here in the front, or we can have that conversation. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to thank all of you for coming tonight to the town hall and giving us the opportunity to interact with you. But if you have other questions, you're welcome to stick around, and we'll be happy to answer those. Sure. Okay, thank you.